I'm so glad to be with you. Um, you may have heard from a couple presenters from my university yesterday that in Cape Girardeau, Missouri, we have received lots of snow and ice. And so we all wish that we could be with you in some month, but maybe next year. <laughs> Um, so as we are um, getting acquainted this morning, I am actually pretty new to HETS, so I would love to hear who is in the room virtually. Um, so if you have the opportunity to put in the Zoom chat um, your role, where you work, and where you're located, it would be lovely to hear um, from each and every one of you. So I'll take a just brief moment to introduce myself. Um, I am actually trained as an anthropologist, and so I generally think of things in terms of positionality, and I think it's important that you know, you know who's speaking um, in order to really get an idea um, of where I'm coming from, too. So my name is Holly Sumner. I am originally from St. Louis, Missouri, which is about two hours north of the city where our university is located. Um, and my role at Southeast Missouri State is being the online instructional coordinator. So I work with all of our fully online degree programs, um, which is undergraduate and graduate. And it's a really exciting role, especially at this point in history, as I'm sure you can all um, imagine. <laughs> We've all learned a lot about online teaching in the last couple of years. Um, so my background is actually in international development. Um, I moved to Nicaragua to study um, international development in the early 2010s and lived there for five years actually. And I'd say that my years in Nicaragua are probably the most transformative of my life so far. Um, they've definitely shaped how I see my profession um, and my other goals, um, especially in terms of what I've learned about active learning and solidarity. So I try to take that approach to my work um, here at the university as well, which hopefully you'll see in this presentation. Um, I also have graduate training in anthropology and international education policy. So I try to really take this multidisciplinary lens. Um, so again, please feel free to introduce yourselves. Hopefully it helps to know just a little bit about me. Um, if you would like to connect with me, I would love to hear from you. You'll see that I have my LinkedIn profile there. Um, and you can also please feel free to email me. Um, my email address is just hsummoner at cmo.edu. So, so excited to be with you all today. Thank you, Hetz, for facilitating this space for all of us to join in virtually and in person. Um, I know that's a logistical challenge, and so um, it's been very smooth so far. So congratulations to you all. Um, and let's get started. Um, first, let me tell you a little bit more about our university. So Southeast Missouri State is, again, um, in Southern Missouri. So you'll see that we are very far <laughs> um, from really anywhere on the coast. Um, we're smack dab in the middle of the continental United States. Um, and we were founded back in 1873. So it's been a very long journey so far. Um, what the university was 100, 150 years ago is very different from what it is now. Um, at this point, we have a total of about 10,000 students. Most of those are undergraduate. Um, over half um, identify as female. And then I wanna make this point very clear from the, from the outset. Our university is in a really different place from a lot of the universities that I've had the privilege of hearing from um, yesterday and today. So we actually do not have um, a very large Hispanic population. We are part of HETS uh, for many reasons, but one of those reasons is to learn how to better serve Hispanic students and be able to recruit more Hispanic students. Um, so that is a direction that we're extremely interested in. We have active um, DEI efforts, um, but it is a very different, I think, student population from a lot of the institutions that are represented here. Um, so 80% of our population does identify as white, um, less than 10% black and African American, and then very small numbers um, of Hispanic and Asian students. 55% um, of our students are first generation, so they are the first ones to attend college and their families. Um, and so we do have a population that is also somewhat non-traditional. Um, and it may bear saying that our surrounding areas um, are very rural. So our university is public. It's a regional comprehensive university, which means that we really serve lots and lots of people um, from our surrounding areas and not just in our city. Um, if you'd like to learn more about our university, please uh, do. We have a newly designed website we'd love for you to see. Um, it's just cmo.edu. Um, and as I mentioned before, I work with our fully online students. So I really work with a very small subset of our students and there's about 1200 of them at this point um, to give you a 
brief overview of, of how the demographics there are different. Our fully online students are predominantly non-traditional, which is a contested term, um, but in general, they are trending older than our other on-campus students. Um, in terms of demographics, they're even more predominantly white. Um, I think we have 3% of our students are Hispanic, um, but it's a very small percentage still. Um, so it's a little bit even more homogenous um, in terms of our fully online population. And I'd love to take any questions about that if there are any. But first, let's really launch into um, our topic for today. So I would love for this to be a really interactive time for everyone here. So whether you are on Zoom or you're sitting um, at, at the university, if you could chime in on this Padlet, um, you can actually use your phone to scan this QR code and you should be able to um, add your response to a Padlet that will pop up. Um, my question for you all in this Padlet is, in your experience, so from your context, from your work experience with the students you work with, what is one key to serving Hispanic students enrolled in online courses? Um, and this may be something you've learned in the context of the pandemic with the shift to mostly online courses. This may be something that your university has learned over a long trajectory of serving students in an online environment. But I would love to hear um, one thing that you've learned. And I will briefly also exit full screen to add this link to the chat in case that's helpful to anyone. So you should be able to use the QR code, but just in case, I'll also add this to the chat. And I will also navigate over to that page in case anyone would like to um, just unmute and share their responses and I will add it to our Padlet. So you should be able to see our Padlet here. Um, this is actually a picture of the fountain in front of our university. Um, so, and this is my dog, <laughs> Estrellita. She's actually from Nicaragua. I've had her for eight years and she moved to Missouri with me when I moved back to the States. Um, and we enjoy walking near the university every day. So I thought you might like to see the uh, background, um, something a little more colorful. Um, it's very white right now because of all the snow, but it's usually beautiful. Um, so in your experience, what is one key to serving Hispanic students enrolled in online courses? And if anyone would like to chime in, um, we, I see that somebody's put inclusion. Um, Somebody else has commented on that and says building community and a deep sense of belonging. That's so, so important. Um, and we can talk about specific ways of doing that. Um, if you'd like to upvote those or comment on those, or if you click on this background, um, double click, you can also add your own um, thoughts here. If you add them to the Zoom chat, I'll also try to make sure um, that they get dumped onto our Padlet as well. Um, so I see somebody else is typing. We'll take just a few more minutes in case you're still chiming in. Um, so we have inclusion. Um, you probably from the title of my presentation know um, a few keys that I would point out, but we'll definitely get to those um, here. Would anyone while we're waiting on more responses like to speak a little bit to inclusion? And maybe how that factors into an online environment. We have somebody else saying under inclusion still concern for students and ability to access support language sensibility and i'd love to hear a little bit more about that one just to have some clarity on that language sensibility is that working with students who may not have their first language as the language of instruction um, reaching out to each person as individuals we have a totally new thread that says connectivity to course, campus, and instructor. So we're seeing a lot of connections here. Support and services for success, absolutely. Mentorship, that's a great one. We're getting all kinds of great responses here. All right, and I see we do have more folks typing, so I will definitely stay on this screen until we've got our thoughts here. Um, if you haven't used Padlet before, this is actually a kind of neat tool because in addition to adding text, you can actually add you know, images, documents. Um, so with students, you can kind of build that connection. Uh, if you're teaching online in a synchronous space or if you're presenting at a conference, um, you can really bring voices together. 
um, and not just with text. We have somebody else saying well-being for the whole student. That's an excellent point. Um, I don't know who was um, fortunate enough to attend Dr. Arvelo's presentation yesterday about her research um, on Hispanic students and um, things that factored into success in online learning environments. But she had highlighted several of the things that you all are also pointing out here. Um, so it looks like we have some consensus definitely on what is um, helpful. All right, so I see we still have somebody typing. So I'll give maybe just one more minute. Um, network building, absolutely. Um, and I don't know if this is everyone else's experience too, but in my experience, our students really do need a lot of scaffolding for network building. I know I needed a scaffolding for network building as well. Um, it just isn't something that comes naturally and, and having some help building um, professional and academic networks, definitely important. All right, so it looks like we may have all the voices um, for this part of the presentation. So I'll try to keep these on um, my back burner as I proceed. So thank you everyone for all of these keys to success. These are definitely all really, really important factors as we're thinking about serving students. Um, and I appreciate, again, coming from an institution that does not have um, a predominantly Hispanic population, knowing your experiences on this as well, um, because you um, probably have more expertise in this area, um, I would say, than, than most of us at Southeast. So I really appreciate it. Um, so why responsiveness and flexibility? Um, if you've read the title of this presentation, you know that that's essentially what this one's about. So if I were to respond to that Padlet, I would probably throw one of these out. Um, depends on the day which one I think is more important. Um, but how did I get to this conclusion? Um, and why am I presenting it if we at our university don't have a predominantly Hispanic population? And how is this relevant? Um, so I'd like to explain that just a little bit. Um, so when I joined our university in November 2020, um, we didn't have any data about what was going well and what wasn't going well for our online students. And as I said before, our online students um, who may never set foot on campus ever while they're pursuing their degree are pretty different demographically from our on-campus students. Um, the main difference for a lot of those folks is age, but with them being older, they also typically have more non-traditional responsibilities. Um, they're caregivers, they care for elderly parents or children. They have part-time or full-time work responsibilities. Um, they may be first-generation students. They may have had a significant gap between high school and college. And so they have all of these different factors um, going into it, which also, according to a lot of the demographic research I've seen, um, appears to be the case for many Hispanic students as well. So you, as I was hearing in presentations yesterday, you know, working with students um, to provide those support services that are needed um, to be working when you have those non-traditional characteristics is important. So I think there's probably some transferable um, takeaways from the research that we've done with our non-traditional students, um, even though there are definitely demographic and contextual differences here. Um, but I'd love to hear what you think is most relevant or maybe not relevant to your populations um, as we go forward. But in the absence of this data, when I joined the university, my kind of first goal was to really hear from our students. I need to hear their voices. I need to know what's going on according to them. We may have retention data, we may have graduation data, but I need to know what's going on. So in May 2021, so almost a year ago, incredibly, um, we launched a survey of our students um, to really ask them, you know, what's going well, what's not going well? Um, a lot of this was oriented towards instruction, but we also asked them questions about advising, the library, textbook services, really all the different things that they, um, and all the different offices that they interact with um, as students at our university. So we were very fortunate to have about 104 students respond to our survey. Um, and it was pretty evenly split, split between undergraduates and graduates. Um, we did have um, many more females than males respond, which is still a little bit um, higher skewed than our general, um, than our general demographics. 85% um, of those who responded were um, classified as non-trad. In this case, um, the variable we used for that was they were over age 25, I believe. 
um, and only 15% were in that traditional on campus, you know, kind of fresh out of high school or recently having finished high school age um, group. And as I mentioned before, um, the demographics of the survey very much matched kind of our overall university demographics with the majority being white, um, about 10%, well, 11% um, black or African American, and then very small groups representing other ethnic groups. Um, so this survey gave us a general overview of what was going on, and, and I'll get more into that um, as we go forward. But um, we also had the opportunity to administer follow-up interviews with um, 12 of those students. So we asked them, you know, if you'd be willing to opt in to a Zoom interview, we would really love to ask you questions um, a little more in depth about your experiences that you've shared on the survey. Um, and I will say also of those 12 follow-up interview participants, only one of those was male. So there's a very interesting skew there as well. Um, so keeping in mind that maybe the data wasn't as representative as I would have liked. Um, I would have liked to see some younger folks um, because they actually do comprise about a third of our population, but only 15% of our survey population. Um, and then speaking to more males um, is something that I hope that we can accomplish in this next upcoming survey this year. Um, but we really did get a pretty firm grasp, um, as far as we know, of what is going on um, in our students' lives. So um, what did we learn? So first of all, this principle of responsiveness. Um, what makes or breaks, you know, their experience? And this was essentially what students said. When we asked them, um, one of the questions we asked during the interviews and on our survey um, was, what do your professors do that makes you feel cared for? Kind of an interesting question. I don't think we think about that maybe quite enough. Um, and almost all of our students, without skipping a beat, they immediately said, Oh, the responsiveness. <laughs> and so digging into that a little bit more, our students mainly talked about responsiveness in two um, kinds of communications. So first, um, they talked about academic settings. So whether a, an instructor would respond to academic questions um, in a caring manner. And usually this was about email. If I email the instructor and I have a question about, you know, homework assignment B, are they going to respond to me quickly or am I gonna wait in a week and then it's due and then I'm lost? Um, and to illustrate this, I actually had a student share a really powerful anecdote with me about uh, a math course. So this student had failed a math course seven times, um, but then she had a different instructor and that instructor, Dr. Johnson, was so responsive to her emails. She credited him with the fact that she had received an A in the course. So this course that she'd failed seven times, all of a sudden, you know, this responsiveness really made uh, the difference for her. So that's a little bit of an extreme example, but it really, it bodes very well for our students academically and in terms of retention um, and how encouraged they feel, whether or not they feel that belonging. Um, if we respond um, to these kind of academic questions. Um, but of course, a lot of those other communications were not academic at all. So the second type of communication that our students talked about um, was really just related to life. Life happens. And if life happens, is my instructor going to be responsive or are they just going to ignore the circumstance altogether? So. As I mentioned before, a lot of our students um, are non-traditional and they have caregiving responsibilities, work responsibilities, and some of these things just create very unexpected circumstances. So for example, one of our students is employed as a 911 dispatcher. Her days look very different every day, depending on what's going on in her community. So she explained that you know every once in a while, she would have to reach out to a professor to ask for an extension on an assignment because even if she tried to work ahead, there were some days that were just so chaotic, she could not get um, done the things that she needed to get done. And so when, when our professors respond in a really responsive way and say, oh, you know, I know you're a hardworking student, or I, I understand, let's work together to figure out you know, an alternative um, plan, that communicated a lot to our students. Um, when they were able to provide that grace. When that grace wasn't offered, especially consistently, 
um, that was a, a, something that really could break the experience for our students. Um, and it's interesting because I've actually received a lot of pushback um, sharing this with faculty so far. Um, there's a lot of faculty, especially after the pandemic, who are very willing to say, you know, of course, it's really important to give our students um, flexibility. It's important to understand that, that life does happen. But then there are others who are really concerned about applying kind of an equal playing field to everyone. Um, and isn't it unfair to my students if I offer this flexibility um, to the person who needs it when they need it? And so we really tried in those conversations with faculty to encourage an equity view instead of an equality view. So sure, if you wanna treat everyone equally, then absolutely, you should hold them to this rigid deadline. You should make no exceptions whatsoever. Um, but if we're really thinking in an equity mindset, each student is coming from a very different place and they may need different scaffolds and different forms of flexibility, just depending on, and responsiveness, just depending on where they are at in life. Um, and I see we have a little message in the chat, which I will try to, all right, love that. Awesome, I'm glad. <laughs> it's been a really challenging conversation with some folks because you know that faculty have the student's best interests in mind um, when they make these comments even, um, but trying to encourage that kind of dialogue is something we've been doing this year. Um, so responsiveness, responding to academic questions, showing understanding when life happens. Um, but there's really two other things that I'd like to point out too that were a little bit less direct in our, our students' responses. Um, but as I began kind of digesting this this year, because I've had a good seven months to think about it, there's actually two other ways in which responsiveness comes into play. So the first of those is in terms of course design. Um, so how can we make courses responsive? So I'll go back to another anecdote from a student. Um, this student has four children and she said, I have supper going, pots overflowing. I'm not in the classroom in a controlled environment. It's a completely unpredictable environment. And so this is not unique to students who have caregiving responsibilities. When we don't have students in a classroom, we really don't know what's going on. Um, and so when we're designing our courses, it's really helpful to keep in mind that as much as it depends on us, let's make that experience pretty smooth. Um, so the biggest thing that, that stands out here in terms of responsiveness is course navigation. So for you, if you're an instructional designer or a professor, or you're working with either of those uh, folks, it's really helpful to put a lot of emphasis on course navigation. So it's things as simple as naming conventions. If your module is named module one, and the next one's named a module B, and then the next one is called week three, and then the next one is just a unit name. Making things easy to follow is a really good practice um, for making your system responsive. Um, and that's something that's really easy to test. Just having somebody else sit down on your course and look at it and say, you know, can you find syllabus? Can you navigate this pretty easily? Or is it a little bit difficult to understand what you need to be doing? Um, those kinds of things really do um, make a huge difference. I'm also going to speak a little bit to assignments, but we'll actually get back to that when we're discussing flexibility. So we'll get more to that on the next slide. Um, so designing courses without these accessibility barriers, so everything from course navigation to assignments and the way they're set up. And if you want to talk more about this, I would love to. Um, I actually will be sharing a one pager at the end of this presentation that gives a little bit more um, detail in terms of course design, what this can look like. Um, so hopefully that will be helpful. And then last thing is kind of stepping back from these nitty gritty things, communication, course design. When we think about our universities, um, I, I think this analogy is used pretty widely. We, we often have issues of silos. So we try to break down those silos. Um, and if you haven't heard that, that metaphor before, it just means that different people on campus doing very different things, never communicating with each other, they are, you know, independent units, um, and there isn't that much collaboration, and there's really no talking going on. Um, so a huge part of um, thinking through responsiveness actually does go back to these overall systems that we're establishing. So how can we make our platforms more responsive? 
not just your LMS, you know, Canvas, Blackboard, Moodle, whatever it is, but also your portal and your website and whatever other technology students are interacting with. How do you make policies that help um, promote responsiveness? So in our, in our case, um, one of the policies that we've thought about since conducting this research is changing the textbook rental policy because right now I think students have three days to return their textbooks even if they live 100 miles away. What if we extended that to five days? <laughs> Wouldn't make a huge difference to us, but it might make a huge difference for students. Um, another policy that came up is, um, and this is a really contested one, a 48 hour response time policy. So can we require instructors to respond within 48 hours during the work week um, to students who have questions. That would make a huge difference to students, um, but it has been something that's been a little bit difficult to put on the table so far. Um, <clears throat> and so thinking about this, um, there's one more thing I did wanna highlight, especially because of um, Dr. Arbelo's presentation yesterday, but she was speaking to um, the research that she did at her institution and she mentioned that um, students had expressed years ago a preference for hybrid environments, but now they are really seeking these synchronous live connections, kind of like what we're doing now via Zoom. Um, and that is something that really stood out in, in our research as well. Students are absolutely craving those synchronous connections, even though they are in these fully online degree programs, which in our case isn't because of the pandemic. These are students that chose this way before we had you know zoom technology and and these ways of connection connecting but this is something that's really really important um to them as well so looking for ways of making those optional synchronous uh opportunities is something that is also probably something you can see on a system level and not just within a course so this is responsiveness at least in the way that we've framed it so far so this is the first principle that I would really love to, to leave you with and maybe have some thoughts percolating on you know, what does responsiveness look like right now at our institution? Um, what are we doing in courses? What are we doing on a system level um, to build this in? The second overarching principle though that came out of our research um, that I hope is useful to you as you're thinking through um, online learning environments is flexibility. So <laughs> this word cloud is actually um, from a student that from a student that I spoke with um, in the context of our research, and she was explaining that um, deadlines have actually become this incredibly make or break kind of issue for her in the last couple years at our institution. So let me kind of delve into that a little bit more, and then we'll tie it back to flexibility. So our institution switched from Moodle to Canvas in officially in spring 2020, so about 2021, I'm sorry. So about a year ago um, the, in the context of the pandemic, which took a heroic effort on the parts of many people on our campus. Um, and it has been a very smooth transition, but there have been things that have come up that just naturally occur um, when you're switching platforms um, that have been a challenge for us. So we, um, for example, have seen that a lot of instructors have now been turning to either timing assignments or locking assignments or switching up deadlines a fair amount. Um, and this student really explained why that had become really an accessibility barrier in terms of flexibility. So she told me, and she actually has five children. I can't say, I mean, there are so many students that I spoke with who just had so much going on. Um, this student said, you know, I used to, when I started taking online courses, be able to finish my work in the first three days of the week. So Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, I would work really hard so that I had, you know, all of my assignments done. And then the rest of the week, I could take care of everything else that I have on my plate. It worked perfectly. And all my deadlines were Sundays at midnight. So I could get everything done during the week and use my own time because that's really why I chose online learning is flexibility. However, once our, once our instructors had switched over to Canvas and started experimenting with these new um, features, they were able to do things like lock assignments so that they're not available until Friday and then time them so that they're only available for a two hour period. And so no longer are you able as an online student to really you know, complete assignments at your own pace 
but now you have to work within this new structure that for a lot of students really just wasn't responding to their their life circumstances. Um, so we've been encouraging our faculty to use these tools sparingly. Locked assignments, I can't say I ever really endorse. I understand why some faculty choose to time assignments. There are a lot of concerns out there about plagiarism um, and academic honesty, and there are ways of using those in powerful ways. Um, but it is something that we have to keep in mind that for this segment of student, if you have students that are doing anything besides school, and most of them are, these kinds of things can really derail their experience really quickly. Um, and for an overall note on flexibility, we did actually have a item on our survey that had students rank everything from advising to peers to interactions with faculty, um, library services, and a couple other components of their experience in terms of importance. So they, they drag one up here and they drag one down here. And incredibly overall, um, flexibility actually won over affordability. And, and this is just in an economic sense. When, when you rank something above money, you know it's something that you have to pay attention to. Um, so our students really are needing that flexibility. That is their number one priority. Um, so building this into all of our, again, courses, systems, our approach to students, is really, really important. Um, all right, so I'm quickly going to draw a caveat to that. And I will admit that it's something that I didn't see for the first several months after collecting this data. But it's a caveat kind of related to equity as well. So we have a wonderful institutional research team that has helped us put our um, data into Power BI, which is really just a, a tool for visualizations. So um, I'm going to ask that we focus just on a little part of the screen. There are so many things we could look at. Um, but if you look at this, um, the right hand side of the screen where it says demographics, um, we've divided it by race. Um, and again, we did not, we only had one Hispanic student respond to the survey. Um, but I think we can draw some lessons to be learned from um, this part. So to really carefully walk through this um, these were all of the factors that we asked students to rank. So we have advising, affordability, Canvas, which is our LMS, um, convenience, course quality, flexibility, interactions with professors, library services, peer relationships, and other, which we could essentially ignore. Um, on the x-axis here, you'll see that we have one which is most important on the left-hand side. So anything that's over there was what students ranked as most important. Ten is the least important, which is a strange, I know, flip-flop, but so everything towards the left-hand side is um, most important for this subgroup of student. Um, so our white students, about 26% of them, if we look at affordability, 26% of them said, yep, affordability, absolutely my uh, number one priority, but 73% of our Black or African-American students said the same thing. So while our overall data said, you know, affordability, not as important as flexibility by a, by a small amount, but still, um, this can look really wildly different for different demographic groups. And it's important to not draw these sweeping conclusions um, without disaggregating that data. So um, just another you know, reminder to be important with that data. If we look at flexibility, which was overall um, most important to students, we'll see that there was a, a pretty big difference here too so with um, white students um, saying, you know, 22% said that's the most important factor um, or the second most important factor. Um, and we'll see that, you know, when we include these two categories, um, it was also very important for Black or African American students, but may not have been, you know, the number one factor. So just a, a quick caveat there that it's really important for us to disaggregate our data um, when we're trying to figure out how to better serve um, these populations. So I will go back to my um, slide really quickly here. I didn't mute it in sharing. I meant to go back to that tab. Um, so that is my big caveat, you know, however, while flexibility was overall most important, let's be sure to um, really look at how different groups 
have ranked this as well. And there are also important differences, you know, by gender um, and other demographic, um, other demographic uh, traits as well. At this point, though, I would love to hear all of your questions. I feel that I've blabbed a lot. I am glad to have heard from your voices on the Padlet, but I would love, love, love to um, hear your questions at this point, if you would like to add them to the chat or just unmute your mic. Or if we have any questions um, in person, I would love to take those as well. Hi, Holly, it's me. Um, thanks for the shout outs. Um, great presentation. I have a quick question for you. So I, I noticed that you only have 1% Hispanic, right, at your institution. So it's pretty difficult, I think, right, to, um, to sway decision making or policy changes with such a small, <laughs> with such a small amount, right, of the population. Um, what are some of those conversations that have come up, if you have had any um, related to this with administration? I know you've dealt with faculty. Um, I heard, you know, I, I was listening to that as well. Um, so can you just provide a little insight about that? Sure. So this is the first iteration of this study. And so the data um, is in its first year, and there are definitely ways we'll approach this a little differently in this coming year, too. I would say at this point, given the population that I specifically work with in our context, we've been largely um, responding to the needs of non-traditional students, um, which really does you know, encompass a lot of folks at this point. Um, and it sounds like just in general in the, in the literature and um, also from your presentation yesterday and some of the other things I've heard, um, those non-traditional needs do have a fair amount of overlap with the needs of other student demographics and so um believe me your point is very very well taken i was <laughs> hesitant to try to make this argument even in the beginning but i thought you know at some point creating these responsive systems it's kind of like when you build accessibility into a course it responds to the needs of one group but it also inadvertently responds to the needs of other groups so my hope is that by creating a more responsive and flexible online learning environment. We serve not only the students that we absolutely had in mind at the outset, which in our case would mostly be these non-traditional students who are about 85% of those who responded to the survey, um, but also the students who um, were not yet serving. I um, mean, that really is you know, a, an, an area of focus. Um, in terms of Hispanic students in general, we do have a group um, on campus um, and I can't speak to this um, super knowledgeably, I only became involved just a few months ago as we were planning Hispanic Heritage Month. Um, but I know that there are other folks um, from our institution that would be much more um, able to speak to that, that I can connect you with that's of interest. So no, this is excellent, actually. What, you know, you made a great point, which is where your strength would lie, right? In making any kind of argument and making any kind of um, suggestions for changes. And that's that you, you're bundling them up then in the non-traditional population, which, you know, when you read the literature is, is the large part of who's in college these days. Um, so, right, so pushing for change or, um, you know, transitioning toward a model um, systemically, right, that, that serves that non-traditional group. I think that's really the way to go uh, because that is predominantly that is online. Um, and in many cases, right, um, you, you have the on-campus group and then the online groups and the online groups, they, they, they kind of mushroom um, because of that the flexibility aspect. And then I have one more, one more follow-up question. It has to do with the instructional design of the, um, of the courses, right? Um, you made some great points. One thing that stood out to me was that there was no um, set policy about responsiveness um, to students, right? And so like during the pandemic, we traditionally had like a 48 hour response time, you know, which is really important, you know, across the board for, for any kind of, we know that, right? We have to help students on um, through their problems so that they can solve them and continue. Um, we changed it to 36 hours 
um, during the height of the pandemic. And we were very clear with, with everyone um, because we understood people were in crisis and, um, and we needed to be more, more flexible on our side. Um, have you spoken to instructional designers? Have you spoken to um, faculty development people about um, setting some parameters around response times? Sure, sure. That is a conversation that's ongoing. Um, I will say that the vast majority of our faculty are fairly responsive. Um, unfortunately, it's those few that maybe, you know, don't have that same practice that um, can stick in the minds of students, but in the vast majority, our, our educators are really wonderful. I mean, they just care for students so well. Um, those conversations have mostly um, been at the administration level and with the faculty senate. So our, our university has a faculty senate that represents the interest of faculty. And so any of those decisions go through that group. Um, so our instructional design teams do um, make a point of encouraging this as much as we possibly can. But at this point, it's more of a suggestion um, and a recommendation than um, an actual policy that, that you know, we would have a little bit a little bit more accountability in that sense. Um, but it's great to hear that you were all able to adapt in that way. Um, I'm sure that was very appreciated by students. Well, when you're small, I think it's easier to, to change. Um, I, I, I think so anyway, you know, and, and being that we're, we predominantly serve a non-traditional population, that was the founder's mission, you know, um, I think that really has carried through for us. So, Okay, great. Um, thank you so much and excellent, excellent data and presentation. Congratulations. I'm really glad you were able to join in our conversation today too. Um, for everyone who is um, still here, this QR code will actually take you to the one page or of um, recommendations I mentioned earlier um, for course design. Um, the words responsive and flexibility actually don't appear very much on this document, funnily enough, but they're very much embedded in the principles and practices um, that we've recommended. And so um, I have really enjoyed this time with you. If there are any more questions, I would be happy to answer them. Uh, thank you, Martha, in the chat. And if not, it looks like I'm right on time. That's great. <laughs> I just love when that happens. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much, everybody. Um, I'd be glad to connect with you. Um, again, you can find me on LinkedIn. I'd be happy to hear from you via email. Um, and I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. <laughs>